Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Scott Stedman Podcast. And today we have an interesting topic we're going to talk about today. We're going to be talking about quiet quitting in ministry. Uh, so joining me on this topic is Micah Current. Micah, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Um curious about the the topic at hand. Um, I've heard of, you know, quiet quitting jobs before, but never really talked about it. So pretty interested in that. Yeah, it's 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 definitely a new phenomenon. Like I think anytime I've looked up information about it, it's um it gets up at like 2022 is when you start seeing a lot of stuff about quiet quitting. So definitely it's a post-pandemic uh concept and something that's happening in workplaces around at whatever service or any job that you can work at. Quiet quitting's kind of a now growing thing now and then it was just kind of curious because we don't really talk about it in ministry but i'm also kind of wondering has it always been in ministry yeah um well so for those who who may not know what it is what is it oh boy well according to definition quiet quitting uh let me see hold on so quiet quitting is defined as a disengaged employee doing the bare minimum, eventually leading to their departure. Despite their dissatisfaction at work, quiet quitters continue to collect a paycheck and then they, until they are finally leave or are terminated. So basically, to sum it up, if you're working at a job or you have an employee at a job and they are just doing the bare minimum, like whatever their job description is, they're fulfilling their duties as a job description – they're maybe not doing more than what they're asked for. Uh, they may do a little bit less, but they kind of basically they're doing like the bare minimum of what they have to do to not get fired. Um, and um, maybe just some statistics. And this is from a kind of a business uh, work blog. And it says 64% uh, of employees consider themselves quiet quitters. Oh, but that's that's pretty high. Um, well, and, oh, uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that I think the way that I look at it is, you know, quiet quitting is yes, what you were talking about, but also I've heard of people like they show up for jobs, they don't like the job, and they just leave and they don't come back. They don't tell their boss. They don't tell whoever their supervisor is. They just they just quit and they don't come back. So it's another form of quiet quitting. Well, um, I, yeah, it, which yeah, is, it's a, which is bizarre. I've heard many of stories over the years, like a friend of mine used to work in human resources at Miami where we used to work. And he told me a story of a time when they hired a new person and they came in for their first day and they left for lunch and they didn't come back. Like they were there half a day. <laughs> oh, didn't even goodness. make it, didn't even make it to lunch. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely um an interesting concept, especially like within workplaces. But I started thinking about this as far as, you know, how do we see quiet quitting in the church? And you know, I think a lot of it, um you kind of like can see some of the um factors of those traits on within ministry like you can get a pastor who starts who starts at a new place and they're excited they're not only doing what's asked of them to do according to the job description of the church but they they're like you know they're trying to do a lot more they're trying to motivate people they're trying to build those community relationships like there's a lot of things that they're doing and then over time you just start to see them slow down and usually we kind of call it burnout which is actually kind of one of the things that causes quiet quitting. So um, there's like in this article, they say that there are five factors that lead to quiet quitting. Um, so the first factor is lack of recognition. Um, employees who feel their contributions are not acknowledged or appreciated may become disengaged and eventually leave quietly. Uh, frustrations over compensation. Um Poor work-to-life balance, and this is where they talk about excessive workloads and long hours can lead to employee burnout or disinterest in the job. 
lack of growth opportunities, um, and also a toxic work culture. So, so according to this article, they have like five reasons that, that can cause people to quiet quit. Uh, lack of recognition, frustrations over compensation, poor work-life balance, lack of growth opportunities, and a toxic work culture. And just looking at those, you can easily see how some pastors or even just people who work in a church, even if it's auxiliary staff, how they can kind of quite quit in ministry because you can see some of those same things within the church and ministry. Yeah. Another thing that comes to mind is uh, checking out. And what I mean by that is that, like, you're just tired of your job, you're, you're burnt out. Like it goes, it kind of goes hand in hand with burnout, but like you get to the point where you're like, this just isn't what I thought it was going to be. This isn't, you know, this is what I thought it was going to be. And I just don't want to do this anymore. Like you said, there's not recognition and, and there's not growth. There's not, you know, there's not a pay raise. There's not like, and, and for ministry, you know, you, you can say that you don't do it for the money, but you still have to provide income for your family. And so, um, I I've experienced it several times in churches that I've worked in where I just feel completely checked out and I'm going through the motions. And I will say that the last church I worked at full time and it was during the pandemic, it was like I was just showing up, right? We were all tired. We were all exhausted. I just kept showing up and doing what I needed to do to, to get by. And the job wasn't necessarily what I wanted, but it was what we needed at the time. And as soon as the opportunity presented itself, I, I left, <laughs> but it was, it was difficult and it's hard to go through the motions in a job that you don't like. You just show up and you get tired of it and you're like, man, I'm just getting a paycheck. And if you don't enjoy what you're doing, you don't enjoy going to work, then especially in ministry, because ministry could be one of the most fulfilling careers out there, but at the same time, it can also be one of the most difficult and um, hard and difficult places to be, especially with this this topic and uh, mainly the burnout conversation, right? Because we see so many pastors just work and work and work and work themselves to death, and they just end up um, get burned out. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, even like a recognition, you know, in October, which um, will be when this episode drops will be the first uh, Friday of October. And, um, you know, that's yeah. usually considered pastor appreciation month, which is funny because sometimes depending on the churches, your pastors are respected and they're loved. And it's like a big month long celebration. Like, each Sunday, there's always something to for churches to say that they're part of their, you know, that they care about their pastors. And for other churches, it's like a one day celebration. Hey, this is Pastor Appreciation Month. Here you go. Here's this big thing. All right. See you next year. You know, kind of like that thing. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, I think when it comes to ministry, I don't really think pastors get frustrated over compensation so much. I think if anything, the frustration comes from when they have to do budget cuts because people aren't giving. And that's always hard because it's like you want people to give, but at the same time, you're also kind of, at least in some churches, pastors are kind of forced to give the talk. Hey, you need to give blah, blah, blah. Um, which I always hated when I've had an elder say, hey, we need to preach, you know, to the congregation. They need to give more money. I'm thinking, yeah, that's not going to go over well. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll preach. I mean, I'll preach something, but I'm not going to like some of the and I remember one guy. He was like saying, you got to tell people that they're robbing from God. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not saying that. Like, <laughs> like, I mean. Because I understand like the whole 10% thing, and this is a whole different topic on tithing, which I think we've already talked about like a couple years back, but like, 
you know, we don't understand people's situations. We don't understand, especially when you have an older congregation, their income is limited if they're just getting social security and retirement benefits. So, you know, it's hard for them to say, okay, give up 10% of your income because 10% of your income is a big deal, especially when you're going to the doctor every like two months and have to pay those medical bills that Medicare. Yeah. Pay. So um, yeah, poor, poor, the poor work-life balance is very interesting to me because I think a lot of that, that is dependent on not necessarily the work at the church, but it's also, how do you manage stuff at your house? And how do you manage stuff in your home? Because if you are bringing work home or, or even if you do have a good balance, but maybe there's people at church who want you to do more. And it's like, well, I'm sorry. After, after six o'clock PM, like that's family time. And I'm not taking phone calls unless they're emergencies. Like if someone's in the hospital, I'll take it. I'll go to the hospital. But if someone wants to call and like talk to me about something, it's like, well, can you do that another day? Or let's set up a meeting. Cause just calling me at seven o'clock at night is not going to um, do any favors for me. Um, lack of growth opportunities. Um, I think in ministry, it depends on A, am I getting raises, you know? And I think B, you know, especially when you're a lead pastor, it's like, well, where else can you go from being a lead pastor besides doing, being a state minister or working on a national level within your denomination? Like, but if you have the interest in doing that, then really there's no way you can grow. Once you become a lead pastor, you're kind of already at the ceiling. Um, and then toxic work culture, that, um, that's hard because when people think of toxic work culture, they think of their boss, they think of the employees that they work with. And if you are a minister on staff, you could definitely see that like, oh, some of my auxiliary staff or maybe the lead pastor is just being very difficult to work with and you have those, those struggles. But especially in ministry, it could also be just the culture within your congregation. Like if you have congreg congregants that are constantly arguing with you and fighting with you and trying to get you fired every year or every month or whatever, like when that kind of becomes, um, when that becomes kind of a issue, and you start to feel your mental health start slipping or fading away, you just don't feel good about the job, then, um, you know, you kind of, like for most people, they'd say, well, hey, if that's what's happening, get the heck out of there. And I totally agree. Like if you're working in a toxic work culture, you might want to just leave because it's not going to get any better. Um, at the same time, I think for a lot of ministers, it's hard to leave. Um for two reasons. The first reason is if you are in a denomination that does more of a cult system, meaning that you put out your, there's a church that has an opening, you put out your resume, you have an interview process, and then you have a candidate weekend, and then the church votes you in or out, basically. Um, that may be hard because if you, let's say you leave the church because it's a, a not, healthy work environment and you're applying to other churches um that could take a long time it's not like oh hey i'm gonna quit my job and then within like four to six weeks i'm gonna get a new pastor role like for the most part it could be years and especially if you're only trained to do ministry and you're not trained to you know be a plumber or a it person or or whatever like your main um, livelihood to support your family is now gone. And that becomes a very difficult, that becomes a very difficult time. So um, at the same time, if you have like a, um, at the same time, if you have a appointed system, you also don't get to choose where you work at. So you could get moved from this church to the next church and it could be a better situation or it could be the same type of culture, or it could be a worse culture than what you came from. Um, and I think that's why a lot of times 
people who work in churches have a hard time leaving a very toxic culture is because they feel trapped. So then that's why they quiet quit in some ways. Like, I'm just going to do the bare minimum of what the church asked me to do or what's in my job description. And that's it. Like, yeah. and especially for small pastors, if you are, you know, if you're also playing the worship service, maybe at the beginning you're thinking, okay, here's my sermon. My sermon topic is on restoration of sin. So now I'm going to find songs that kind of tie into my message where then at the end you might be like, okay, here's my message. Um, and then I'm just going to pick these few songs that everyone likes to sing. And then that's what we're going to do. And you no longer put the effort into your worship planning. Uh, you may do Bible studies, but maybe you don't really overly prepare. You just kind of prepare enough to know what you're talking about. Um, and even when it comes to just building relationships, like you may be kind of like that pastor who after you're done preaching, like maybe you don't stand by the back door. Maybe you go to your office and you, and that's it. Like you just don't engage with the congregation. You completely you say, hey, check out, which is like yeah, what I said earlier. Yeah. You just yeah. you check out from what you're doing and don't have any, you know, uh, you don't have a will or a way to do any of the stuff that you're supposed to do. You like, like you're saying that you scrape by the, by the bare minimum. Um, I also think that it's interesting. You said something about the giving conversation. Like, you know, I, I've, I've sat in rooms where pastors were like, well, we, we're not going to have to cut salaries, but we, we may get that pastors making six figures a year. I'm like, well, why don't we cut 30% of your income? You know, like it, if you're, you're living, high on the horse and you're sitting pretty and the rest of us are, you know, scraping by part-time and, and, and by vocationally and everything else. And you're saying you're going to cut my, my stipend, but yet you make six figures a year. Like it's no wonder, like you already have the pressures of, of leading a church and congregations and the demands of those people. And then you stack on top of it, a pastor who may sit there and preach about budgets and cutting budgets when they make all this money. Um, and I know that's a separate conversation for a separate day, but that's just another reason people may quit, right? They don't want to put up with it. Like I yeah. remember doing, doing some stuff at a church through a transition where I was, you know, doing my job, which was part-time. I was bivocational and I was literally asked to do everything in the place of our creative arts guy who left and I didn't get any pay increase. I didn't get any, uh, you know, recognition. I didn't get any, you know, you know, out of boy. And, and again, it's not about that, but like I saw during that time period of my ministry where it was just like, I don't know, in a year we lost five staff members because we just because of bad leadership and, it was just like this domino effect. And, and a lot of it had to do with what we're talking about today. Like one thing led to another and it's like the leadership was like, all right, one person quit. We're going to dump all the responsibilities on the next person. Yeah. And when that person quits, we're going to dump all the responsibilities on the next person. And when that person quits and, and just so on and so forth. But then at the same time, not replacing the jobs once those people have left because it was during the pandemic and nobody knew what was going to happen. And financially it just makes sense to replace people once they left, but it was almost like, Oh, how much can this next person take? And as a result, you just have all these people quit or in the case of what we're talking about today, quiet quitting. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating because I mean, I think a lot of times quiet quitting, not only do we see it with church staff and, and pastors and stuff, you also see it with your volunteers too. Like if you, and I think that's kind of what makes quiet quitting so dangerous within ministry. Cause if you say you have a pastor who's now just doing the bare minimum and yeah. is like not checking in, not minimal interaction with their congregation, or especially with their volunteers, then guess what happens? 
your volunteers start leaving, which then puts more pressure on that pastor who now either A, needs to is is has to step up and do it which means they have to now do more than what's required for them to do or they really start being gun ho about volunteers but again you may get some more people to volunteer but if you don't show your appreciation to them it just kind of defeats the purpose and i think that's kind of where um or let's say the pastor finally just, just says okay i'm leaving bye <laughs> it wasn't caring and it, it wasn't caring about volunteers. Well, now you have a congregation that has no volunteers to help run things. Nobody that knows how to train or do things. The people who do know how to do it are burnt out or feel under or feel devalued. So then they're not going to step up and do it. And it's just kind of, if they haven't left already and you just get into a very messy situation <laughs> Yeah. What were some of the other things in that list, the five? Oh, the the causes. So lack of recognition, frustrations over compensation, poor work-life balance, lack of growth opportunities, and a toxic work culture. I think we've talked about all of those except for really the the um the growth opportunities. Um I I don't know that there are in ministry, a lot of growth opportunities, unless you're like an associate pastor looking to be a lead pastor. But even yeah. then, unless the lead pastor leaves and they offer you that position or there's some sort of succession plan and the lead pastor retires and then you're kind of appointed the next lead, you're going to have to leave. Yeah. Uh, and, and kind of, yeah, go ahead. Well, even like with that, like, you know, even like, let's say you're an associate and you can't go up because the lead's there. Um, but let's say you're a church that's now starting to do church planning, and now the associate's now kind of becoming the pastor of the church plant or the satellite church. Like there's some times to grow, but yeah, once you get to the top, like once you're lead pastor, the only way you can move up is either A, go into a, a church that may be a little bit bigger, may have a little bit more compensation, maybe a higher pay raise by going to a different church, or if you start working on a more power driven thing which is working on a state or national level um and if you're doing that but then not many pastors you know i think when pastors decide they get called to ministry they want to preach they want to help people and i think a lot of them they don't have no desire to be the general director of a denomination or be the director or a state pastor or a regional minister or whatever like or a professor at a Christian university, like, you know, they may not have that desire to do that. So you, you, yes, yeah, so I think the only thing that I think would be different when it comes to quite quitting is that lack of growth opportunities, because there really is no opportunities for, at least when it comes to business growth, um, you know, or growth is dependent on how well you in your congregation are able to live out the gospel. So you see a spiritual growth and also you start seeing a numerical growth where people are starting to come to your church. People become members. They start to give to the church and you start to see, you know, that increase both in people participating in church services, people giving that may increase more, ministry opportunities that may increase benefits that may increase you know you may actually get a raise you know instead of staying at the same uh pay threshold for the last seven years of pastoring at that same church like you know that's really the only time you have growth but if you have a congregation that is not radical in their mission and outward focused and you have a pastor who's just kind of I like to preach, but I really don't want to do like any type of evangelism. I'm going to kind of force my people to do it and I'm not going to do it myself. Then, you know, you're, you're going to be staying at the same place and and you may not see more growth. You may see more decline in the how, decline opportunities and growth opportunities. Well, too, like, you know, I've, I've been open on this podcast, but like I, I work in higher ed and, in the office in which I work right now, 
I'm the I'm an I'm in an entry level position, and there's nowhere for me to move up. The job itself requires a high school diploma. I have an advanced degree. My staff knows that I'm looking because there's literally nowhere for me to move up within my office. And so it, just to piggyback off of what you said in growth, it's like, well, sometimes you have to to move on in order to 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 get the five things that we're talking about today. Right? Like you, you can start somewhere and then continue uh in another place, ministry assignment, et cetera, if you want to get more money, more recognition, more experience. Um, but I do find it fascinating that people are, are doing this thing called quiet quitting. And it's, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know. It's, it's it's like we we create this culture of like the minimum expectations. I'm sorry. We we create this culture of the the maximum ex, you know expectations of our employees and the people that we ever see and yet we don't compensate them well. We don't treat them well. We don't, you know, and not that this is a lesson in economics by any means, but like it's the same thing in the world. Right. It's yeah. the same way uh -huh. in the workforce. Like you get to, you know, I don't know, name a fast food joint. There's nothing wrong with working at a fast food joint. But if you don't treat your employees well, then it's going to be no wonder when they quit. Yeah. And, you know, I, great example of this of how to treat your employees Chick fil A. They run Chick-fil-A like a machine. The kids know what to do. Most of the time you see a bunch of teenagers, you know, working at Chick-fil-A and they run it like a machine. And and what I mean by machine is that like they they know what's expected of them and they know what to do when when they come to work. And the customer service is always key in everything they did, you know, everything that they do in their experience. Your experience as the consumer. But in a in in light of how well things work at Chick-fil-A, I don't know, pick like, I don't know, Taco Bell, for example. You may not have the best experience at a Taco Bell. You're getting paid minimum wage. People don't care. They're coming to work. They're doing the bare minimum. They just want a paycheck. And there's really not a, room, a lot of room for growth for them. It's, it's hard, right? It and is. so... It's just, it just, I, I know I'm all over the place with this conversation, but it just feels like, I think that you can, it just proves that you need to treat your employees better to, to treat your staff better, to figure out where they are, right. To figure out where they're struggling, how they can grow, how you can help them make more money. Um, and another thing I would add is if you're a lead pastor, and you have a staff member that's ready to move on because they've outgrown the position of ministry and you can't pay them more money and you can't give them any more opportunities, then don't get mad if they get another opportunity. Yeah. En encourage them. Help them. Help them pursue whatever it is that their hearts desire or what God's calling them to do. Because if they if they pursue that, it's going to make their transition that much easier for the church and for you as a leader. Yeah. And I think, you know, and I think a lot of times, like, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of like looking at like, how do you prevent quiet quitting? And, you know, and some of the things are just very simple reasons. So uh, things like doing the regular check-ins, like if you have a pastor who's starting to feel burnout, or if you're a board member and you start noticing, man, their pastor's starting to seem like they're disengaging, then check on them. What's going on? What are some of the challenges? How can we help you? And I think yeah. that's kind of the thing. And I mean, here's the thing, like, and I always say this every time. Mm -hmm. It's different when a pastor has to say to the congregation, we need more volunteers. It's different when the pastor has to go up to the people and say, hey, we need to give more money because we're not we're not 
able to pay our bills. And if we really enjoy, if we say we care about our staff, if we say we care about this church, if we say we care about this community that we're a part of, then you also have to show it with giving. And if you can give, and we're just asking you to give anything. If you're not giving, start giving. If you're giving a little bit, you'll try to work your way up to 10% of your income. Like if, if an elder board member was to say that or a church employee was to say that and address the congregation that way, you would probably see a lot more people volunteer. You probably see a lot more people than give because it's one of you. It's another congregational member saying these things. It's not a pastor. It's not a someone who's paid that's trying to do it. Like it's someone else saying, hey, uh, this is kind of the thing. Um, also make sure, and this is gonna, and this is kind of both on the congregation side and the pastor side, but make sure you have opportunities to have a more balanced work-life relationship, like. You know, if there's a time where you have to say at this time, I'm not going to answer my phone. I'm not going to do things that's work related. I'm going to spend time with my family or I'm going to go to the gym or I'm going to go fishing or play disc golf or whatever the thing you love to do. Like make sure you schedule in time for things that you enjoy doing so you're not constantly being um pulled in by the congregation's needs and expectations. Um, offer fair compensation for work. Like I know that's that will probably be more of the challenging thing. Um, and then as an elder board or even as a pastor, if, you, or if you're pastoring employees, one of the things they mentioned here, what I thought was interesting is, you know, you always have people who when they leave a job, you do an exit interview, right? Mm -hmm. And you do an exit interview and basically you do an exit interview to see, okay, why are you leaving? What are some things you can improve on? And you're asking these questions while that person's walking out the door. What they're proposing in this article is doing stay interviews like once, like every year. Hey, why do you want to work? Why do you still want to work here at this church? What do you love about your job? What are some things that can we can improve to keep you healthy and happy and want you to stay part of this community? I mean, you do that in a you do that every year, then you don't have to worry about, okay, here's what this person said while they're out the door. Okay, let's try to fix things now after some of our good employees just left. Or let's talk to our good employees now, ask them why they love working here, why they want to stay here, what can we do to make things better? And then I think as a pastor, and I think this is more on the pastor's part and any in the elder board's part, if it, if you're the lead, um, always make sure that when there are challenges or issues that you have an open mind and an open door and an open heart to hear and listen and not get defensive. Because if you truly care about growing, like even if a pastor saying, well, there's this, there's this, you know, listen to them, assess everything, make sure they feel valued and heard. And then if you, afterwards, if you're doing research and you find out, oh, that person's just grumbling and complaining because we are doing this, like, I don't know what more we can do, then you might be like, okay, you know, what do you mean? Because it seems like we're doing this, 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 and this, like, why are you still unhappy? Like, because then that may be something more underneath on why it's causing their unhappiness and not necessarily what they verbally said. But if they're saying things like, you know, I'm, it's a struggle to get volunteers and I really don't know how to do it. Like for me, um, okay. If I was not a pastor, if I was just a, an elder board member and my pastor said, that's like, okay, I'm, I either, I'm going to step up or maybe I'll have one of our other volunteers, like our Sunday school teachers say up and say, Hey, we have a great Sunday school program. We have a lot of kids. However, we don't have enough people to really give the adequate care and love to all these kids who are passionate about learning about Jesus. So we really need people to sign up for uh, volunteer roles, up, volunteer roles within or serving Sunday school roles. for children or serving roles. Yeah. yeah. So. But yeah, I mean, some of these things you can easily apply within a ministry context, then you'll probably have, you know, pastors who, you know, even though ministry has its bumps, um, at least 
knowing that, hey, I have a congregation that values me, that sees me, that cares about me. And even when I'm going through a rough patch of ministry or a dry spell or even just um, trying to figure out, you know, what to do, I feel like I'm kind of in a rut in ministry. At least you have people who can say, hey, let's talk about it. What are some of the things you enjoy? Well, we'll do keep doing the things you enjoy and let's see if we can find some some members who can do the things that can help complement your weakness or the things that you struggle with. Like there's opportunities for anybody to really help out. So uh, that's, that's pretty much up for me as far as talking about quiet quitting and ministry. Micah, did you have anything you'd like to add? No, but I think it's fascinating that people are, um, I, I really like the idea of the, uh, the interviews, like the stay interviews instead of quiet quitting, like, if you know having a staff eval every year see where your guys are you know follow up with your staff see what they're you know see what they're doing see how they're feeling see if they're trying to advance the career help them you know see if you can get them to continue where they are um i, I would also say too that if they're they're seeking a transition make it the best possible for them uh-huh you know celebrate the time that they've had the, the 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 assignments uh that they're currently at and then once they're done you know appreciate the time they're there and encourage them and ask them if they can help or if, if you as the leader can help in any way then yeah yeah be a bless be a blessing to them because they've been a blessing to the community that they've been that for a while yeah absolutely absolutely well friends let us know what you think Maybe you find yourself in a position where you are kind of realize, oh man, I am quite quitting in my ministry. You know, um, you know, here are some ways. Maybe a lot of it's due to work life, a uh, work life balance, and you need to get that kind of under control. Uh, maybe you're a pastor and you notice, hey, I have a lot of staff members who are unhappy, and I'm always doing these exit interviews. Maybe doing monthly check ins or doing these stay interviews, like maybe that can kind of help turn the culture around within your church. So let us know what you think. Tell us about um, all that stuff. And uh, we would love to hear from you. You can send us either comment on our social media pages where you listen to this podcast, or you can go to our website, the and, um, and be able to uh, send us an email. So friends, thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll be back on with another episode. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Scott Simmons Podcast. The Scott Simmons Podcast is made possible by support from our listeners. We thank listeners like Patty and Scott, whose support goes to this podcast's continual growth and maintenance. If you want to support this podcast, you can do so in a number of ways. First, feel free to give us a five-star rating if you enjoyed this episode and share it with your friends. If you'd like to financially support the Scott Simmons Podcast, you can go to the website ko-fi.com slash the Scott Simmons Podcast. That website again is ko-fi.com slash the Scott Simmons Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.